Well, hey, everybody, welcome to church this weekend. Glad you're here. Thanks for joining us. And let me say hello to all of our locations and all of you who are joining us online right now. We're very, very glad that you're with us this weekend. And as you heard, Easter is just a week away now. We've been praying and planning and preparing. And as I always do, want to encourage you not just to be at one of our locations next weekend, but invite somebody to join you. Easter's the best time of the year to get a yes to an invitation to church. And it's going to be a very powerful weekend. So make sure you invite someone to come with you. And then secondly, I want to encourage you to be praying uh, this week for Easter weekend. Let's believe God to do a great work here next weekend in the hearts of people and in every life-giving church around our region, not just at the journey, but everywhere that uh, Jesus is going to be lifted up next weekend. Pray with your J group, pray on your own, pray with your family. Let's believe God together. And then I want to encourage you to serve as well. So if you are part of our J team, this is our Super Bowl weekend coming up next weekend. And I want to make sure that you get a chance to serve. It's going to be a lot of fun. We've got some special things planned for all of you who are serving on our J team. And if you're not on the J team yet and uh, you want to be, you can come to step two of Plugged In this weekend and we'll find a place for you to serve. We can get you serving um, as quickly as Easter weekend if you are uh, open to that, want to be a part of it. We want everybody to be able to serve on Easter weekend. And then last but not least, I want to encourage you to give in our Easter offering. We're celebrating that this weekend. And this is an opportunity for us to give to help people who are not here yet and people outside our walls. We're giving to invest. I'm very excited about this in a mobile food distribution unit so that we can take fresh quality food to people who are in need. We do that already here uh, at our physical locations, but we want to be able to get around our region to people in need. We're giving to invest in leaders and plant churches and coach pastors. And then last but not least, the, the last part of our Easter offering is going to go to continue to reach Journey City, to make more space for people to experience God here. Last year, we gave in our Easter offering and launched our Middletown location. And we've got some exciting opportunities in front of us as a church to reach more people as well. So I'll tell you more about the Easter offering at the end of the message today. But during this series, we've been talking about things Jesus taught that can change the game when it comes to living out our faith. And if you missed any of the messages, I encourage you to go back and, and you can watch those on our YouTube channel or our website or our app and get caught up to speed because each, each message has really kind of built this foundation of what it looks like to not just say we're followers of Jesus, but to live that out. And as we wrap that up today, we're going to look at something Jesus said that really gets to the heart of how he calls us to be game changers in this world and really gets to the heart of what we believe about Jesus and um, what all of that can look like as we lean into another level of our faith. So last year, I had a complete physical exam done. First time in my life I've ever done this. And had all of these tests done, and it was preventative, uh, so it's not because there was uh, some specific thing, but you know, when you get in your late 20s, you start to realize you got to take better care of your health, at least that's what I've been told, but really a big part of it was that there were some tests done on my heart, so again, not because I had a specific issue, but my dad died of heart disease uh, many years ago. Heart disease is actually the number one cause of death in America, and I just, as part of this, had some tests done on my heart just to make sure that my heart was healthy. And one of those tests was a stress test. Anybody ever have a stress test? Did it stress you out? It stressed me out to have a stress test. If you're not familiar, here's what happened. They hooked a bunch of little patches up to me, and they showed me a treadmill, and they said, we want you to run on this treadmill. We're going to gradually increase the speed and the incline of the treadmill, and right before you're going to die, give us a heads up, and that'll be the end of the test. It may not be exactly what they said, but that's what I heard. They were like, go as long as you can, and you know, when I started out, I was like, oh, they have never seen anybody who's going to perform as well on this stress test as Mark Johnson, and I think 16 minutes, 43 seconds later, I was like, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And they stopped the test, and they told me the results, and they told me I, I, I needed to pay a little bit more attention to my physical fitness, but the good news is my heart is fine, physically. Yes, this is good. So, not sure what to do with 
11 people being excited that my heart is fine, but it's okay. I'll talk to my therapist about it this week. Everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be fine. <laughs> my physical heart is fine, but did you know that the number one cause of spiritual death is spiritual heart disease? Here's what I mean. Spiritual death happens not when the physical organ in our chest stops beating and gives out, but when our heart, the heart of who we are, loses touch with the heart of who God is. And it doesn't happen overnight, it takes time, but, but things can build up in our spiritual arteries that prevent our hearts from functioning in a healthy way. And thankfully, just like there are habits that we can put in place to prevent physical heart disease and delay it, there are habits that we can put in place to prevent spiritual heart disease. We've talked about some of those during this series, and we actually built our church around these habits. When we gather like this, it's preventative for heart disease, because as we worship together, if we'll, if we'll lean into that, as we hear God's word taught, our hearts are strengthened. When we connect in community in groups, it strengthens our spiritual hearts. They begin to beat stronger. When we serve, when we take the talents and the time that we've been given, and we use those to help others, and we serve people in need, or whether that's spiritual need or physical need or whatever it may be, we serve the people around us, it strengthens our hearts. And there is another habit that Jesus talked about that strengthens our hearts, and that is giving away our money. Amen. Giving away our money. Now, if you're new to church, not sure what you believe about God yet, uh, you may find that a little bit uncomfortable. In fact, you may be thinking, of all the weekends... I thought this was Easter. Next weekend is Easter. Um, you may be thinking, did I choose the wrong weekend to come to church? And I get that. And I know it can be a little bit uncomfortable based on what our background or experience has been with church and religion and money and all of those things. But here's what I know. Here's what we can all get on the same page around. That chances are good, whatever you believe about God, wherever you are in your spiritual journey, you believe in the power of generosity. Most of us do. Whether you're spiritual, follower of Jesus, an atheist, an agnostic, whatever, however you would describe yourself. We, if I were to ask you, do you think it is better to be a generous person or a stingy person? Most of us would say it's better to be generous. At least we believe in the power of generosity when it benefits us, correct? Like when we're the recipients, we are definitely like, generosity is good, thank you for lunch. Like if somebody pays for us, we believe in generosity. So we all believe in the power of this, but for all of us who are followers of Jesus, and if you're not yet, you can take a pass on some of the things I'm going to talk about today, because they really are aimed at those of us who have, who have leaned into our relationship with God, but for all of us who are followers of Jesus, we have this question, I think, I do many times, how generous am I supposed to be with my money? And I think all of us, at least most of us, would say giving nothing is not an option. I know that would mean I was not generous. But we read some things in the Bible, there's some times where Jesus called people to give everything or people responded to him by giving everything and we think, that can't be, I don't even want to pray about that, I'm not sure that's what God's will for my life. But we find ourselves in between wondering how generous am I supposed to be? What's healthy spiritually when it comes to giving away our money? And then I think we wonder, like, isn't giving money something rich people are supposed to do? I mean, they're the ones who have extra, they should give the money, we wonder, does giving really have anything to do with the condition of our hearts or relationship with God, or is that just something that money-hungry preachers came up with? And we have these questions, and those are all great questions. They're questions Jesus knew we would have. And so, Jesus one day sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. I saw someone uh, one time wearing a t-shirt, had an image of Jesus on it, and underneath it said, I saw that. And I think for a lot of us, that's kind of how we think about Jesus, and sometimes not in a good way. We're, we're like, is Jesus watching all the time? Maybe our experience with religion has led us to believe he's just always watching with a disapproving look on his face. But here we find Jesus watching. He's at church. The temple is like what church would be today and there's a collection box and people are giving money and Jesus is watching. And again, I know for some of us it may feel a little bit uncomfortable because that was not common. Uh, we don't encourage that here, by the way. We don't ever say like, turn and watch the person next to you as they give. 
It's kind of a little bit awkward, but Jesus says, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find a place. I wanna, I wanna watch what's happening right now. And I think there are two things that are really important in what we just read. The first is that Jesus comes to church. And that is something that Christians believe, that he is here right now among us. We may not be able to see him with our physical eyes, touch him with our physical hands, but we know his presence is here. In fact, Jesus promised, when you gather in my name, I'm right there among you. And so we believe that. We believe he's going to be among us next weekend as we celebrate what he's done for us, that Jesus is here with us. And the second thing is that when Jesus comes to church, he watches how we respond. He watches whether we lean in or write him off. Why? Because that reveals the condition of our hearts. And that is what Jesus is interested in. He is not really that interested in how we appear on the outside, but he is very interested in what's happening on the inside of us. How strong, how healthy is my heart? Jesus cares a great deal about that in spiritual terms. So Jesus watches as these people give their money. And what does he see? He sees many rich people put in large amounts. Everyone say large amounts. Large amounts. Aha. So there it is. Rich people should do all the giving. Am I right? Am I right? Like the people who make a lot of money, the people who have a lot of resources, they should do the giving. Rich people put in large amounts. And that's not untrue. It is not a bad thing that there are rich people at church on this particular day. It's not a bad thing that they're rich. It's not a bad thing that they're at church. Certainly not a bad thing that they are giving large amounts. That's a good thing. Nothing here indicates that there's anything negative about this. And for a lot of us, we probably don't feel very rich. I don't meet very many people who are like, you know what? I am loaded. <laughs> Even if they are. Like, a lot of us don't feel very rich. And for some of us, we are not very rich. Some of us perhaps may be making very little money, have very little income, have very little to our names where things are tight. But many of us, many of us are richer than we feel. I think this is true in my life. I think I am richer than I feel. I don't always feel rich, but I think I'm richer than I feel. And the reason I believe that is because in global terms, it really gives context to this idea of being rich. For instance, if our household income, total combined household income, is $100,000 a year or more, we are in the top 10% wealthiest households in the world. We're rich. So if you're in that, if your household income is $100,000 a year or more, you are, congratulations, you are rich. I know, for some of you are like, I make that much money, but I do not feel rich. And I get that. If you don't make that much money, maybe you make less than that, maybe you don't even make half of that, you probably don't feel very rich. But thank God, there are people at church on this particular day who are rich, whether they feel like it or not, they are giving large amounts that's amazing, but that is not what catches Jesus' attention. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. When I read this, I immediately think of my mom. My mom uh, is a widow, has been for a long time, and my mom would never say that she is poor, uh, but she lives in a one-bedroom apartment. She relies on Social Security and uh, I send her a little bit of money every month. My siblings, uh, we, we send her some money every month. Sometimes we send her money, and you know what she does with it? Gives it away. But my mom, as simple as her life is, she lives in this little one-bedroom apartment. She does not have a lot of money in the bank. Her only income is the check she gets each month from the government and the little bit of money that we send her. And yet she is one of the closest people to Jesus that I know, one of the most content people that I know. And I, I think there's a connection there. But before we go any further with this story, I believe we need to acknowledge the elephant in the room. Because we have, ladies and gentlemen, a math problem. This, okay, track with the story. Many rich people give large amounts. Everyone say large amounts. Then a poor widow gives a Small amount. Everyone say small amount. Okay, so we're going to do a quick math quiz, okay? Don't worry. It'll be easy, but we're going to do a little math quiz. I worked all week, prepared this for you. Here it is. 
Which is more? A, one million dollars, or B, one hundred dollars? So if you think A, all of our locations, shout out A. A. All right, if you think B, all of our locations, shout out B. B. Okay, a couple of people think B is more, in which case, I would like to borrow a million dollars. You understand what I'm saying? Because you think, okay. So the math here, it's not a trick, is relatively straightforward. Which is more, a million dollars or a hundred dollars? And all of us, if we're thinking purely mathematically, would say a million dollars is more. A million dollars is more than a hundred dollars, right? Right? And yet Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. To which I say, uh, Jesus, no. I'm sorry, but I took math in school. And even if I only got a C, I still know she did not give, him, she did not give more. They gave large amounts. She gave a small amount. There's no way that she gave more unless God does math differently than we do. There's no way she gave more unless the amount we give counts more to God when it means more to us. And that's what Jesus is saying here. In fact, he goes on to explain how God's math works. They gave a tiny part of their surplus. Yes, it was a large amount, but it represented only a fraction of what they had. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. And that is a game changer. What causes our hearts to change in any area? It's when we realize that God is seeing something differently than we are. For all of us who've, who've had our hearts transformed by God, part of that awakening was realizing God sees something I don't see. He has a perspective that I don't have. We change when we realize that God sees our struggles differently than we do, that he sees our successes differently than we do. And in this case, that God sees our finances and our money and our math differently than we do. And if you're skeptical, by the way, I get it. So am I. I am like, God, more equals more. That's what's more. In fact, sometimes I've been like, God, if you give me more, I will give you more. And God says, actually, the research shows that if I were to give you more, you would actually proportionally give less. Because it's a hard thing. And not just a math thing. And giving is not just a math thing. It really is a hard thing. The amount we give counts more to God when it means more to us. Put it this way. God measures how much we gave by how much we kept. We are measuring the amount given God is measuring the amount we kept that we're relying on to take care of us. And that's kind of refreshing, isn't it? I mean, especially if you, if you wouldn't say you're a follower of Jesus yet and you're, you're not into knowing Jesus and knowing God and maybe not into the giving thing. I mean, this has got to be kind of refreshing for you because what it means is that Jesus is not just some money-hungry preacher just going for the big gifts, but he is... Concerned about the heart. He is measuring differently. There's a couple in our church who made a decision years ago uh, to put God first in their finances by tithing, giving the first 10% of their income back to what matters to God through, through their church. And there are a lot of us who do this, a habit that I've had since I first started following Jesus. When I was 15 and I was working at Pizza Hut and I took 10% of everything. How many know I did not make a lot of money working at Pizza Hut? But started tithing, and there are a lot of us who do this, and there's a couple in our church who've been doing this. They shared their story that they kept doing this when they had a lot, and there were times they, they did have extra, and they were grateful to be able to put God first, and then there were other times when things were really tight, and it was tempting not to give, and yet they continued this habit, 
and they kept putting God first. And they went through seasons when they drove old cars and they had to pray that they wouldn't wear out. How many of us have been there? Just pray in that thing and make it down the road. And, and they had a, an occasion where lawn equipment was stolen out of their garage and they didn't have any money to replace it. And then one, late one night, God woke one of them up in the middle of the night with this strong impression to go shopping for car insurance. And they didn't know why, but when they got it all said and done, the amount they saved on their car insurance, this is not a Geico commercial, by the way, <laughs> but was enough to replace the lawn equipment that had been stolen. And they, they went on and on, and here's what they said. God continues to amaze us by providing for our needs when we give. Why? Because Jesus is watching. He is watching when we give. And he's not just watching because he wants to catch us being greedy or anxious or stingy. No, Jesus is watching because he's hoping to catch us being faithful and generous when we have a lot to give and especially when we feel like we don't. And I love the way Jesus describes this poor widow's gift. When he's leading into it, this amount that she gave that to us seems so small, two small coins. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. She gave more. It's as if he's challenging us to decide which version of truth we're going to build our lives on. And certainly that rings true for us because we are living in a generation where everybody's got their own truth, right? My truth, your truth, our truth. And yet Jesus says, which version of truth are you going to build your life on? Your own version? The, the version that's popular in the world around you right now? Somebody else's version of truth? Or are you going to build your life on my truth. And here's something else so fascinating about this story we just read. That this actually sets the stage for the final few days that Jesus spends on earth before he goes to the cross. And shortly after this moment, he disappears, is with his disciples, and then he goes to a cross and dies and gives everything he has to forgive our sins and to rescue us from a life without God and a life without hope. Isn't it fascinating that one of the last things Jesus did before he went to the cross was sit down and watch. And it's as if when he saw that widow give, he recognized her heart immediately because it was the same heart that was beating in his own chest. He knew she had the heart of God because of the way she gave. And that same Jesus, by the way, if you're like, well, where should we give and where, where do we be generous? That same Jesus is the one who said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. If you wonder, have you ever, some of you have wondered, why do Christians give to their churches. Can I just tell you right now, the church is messed up. And it'll always be a little messed up because it's full of messed up people. But it is the only plan Jesus has to get his work done in this world and his message to those who are lost. And Jesus sees this poor widow at church giving everything she has. And he says, I recognize that heart. So what does giving money have to do? with preventing spiritual heart disease. Here's what Jesus said about it in another place in the Gospels. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Now I want you to notice, Jesus does not say do not have treasures on earth. He says do not store them up. Don't make accumulation the goal of your life. Make contentment and generosity the goal of your life. Why? Very simple. Because wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Here's what Jesus knows. When we focus on accumulating wealth in this world or on worrying about what we don't have, when we live in anxiety and distress around our money and we hold it back and we store it up, our treasures, whether they feel like a little or a lot to us, become like plaque building up in our arteries. My physical exam 
last year, one of the things they did was test for how much calcium was present in my arteries and in my body. And it's a sign of buildup in there. They said, you know, we, we want to make sure there isn't a buildup in your arteries. Jesus says, don't build up, store up treasures on earth. It'll block the life-giving flow of God's goodness in your life. Instead, invest in what matters for eternity. And again, he didn't say don't have treasures. He was saying don't make accumulation your priority. Make generosity your priority. And when that plaque builds up in our arteries, what happens is our heart's struggle doesn't happen overnight, but it happens over time. And so Jesus asks all of us who believe in him, rich, poor, everywhere in between, to keep our hearts healthy by storing up treasures in heaven, by giving toward what matters to God. And I know I still haven't answered your question, but how much should we give? Here's the answer. I don't know. That's between you and God. All I know is this. The amount you give counts more to God when it means more to you. It's a hard thing. And sometimes the only way to know if our heart is healthy is a stress test. So there are moments in life when God says, hey, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. I wanna test the health of your heart. I'm gonna ask you to trust me at a different level. I'm gonna ask you to be generous in a way you don't think you can. I'm gonna ask you to run on a treadmill until you think you're gonna die. And then right before, just let me know and we'll see how healthy your heart is. But I can't create those moments for you. God does. So next weekend, Easter is coming and we have an opportunity to be generous as a church. And here's how, very simple. We can make Easter count first by inviting people to come with us and experience God's presence. Don't keep the message of Jesus to yourself. Spread it to everyone you can. We can make it count by praying for people to experience the powerful work of Jesus in their lives across our locations. And again, at every life-giving church in our region when they come next weekend. Thousands of people just in our church will stream into our locations looking for hope. We can pray that God will move. We can serve. We can be a smiling face. We can open a door. We can serve in kids ministry. We can set up, tear down at our location. We can park cars. We can make sure that one of the cars we park is not ours if you're at our broadcast location, but it's at the School for the Deaf and we rode the shuttle. <laughs> Those are ways we can make Easter count. And then finally, we can give. You can be a part of what Jesus is doing in the world through your generosity in the Easter offering. We do these things to honor Jesus, and we do these things for people who need Jesus. But we also do these things for the health of our own hearts. And if you would say this final week of the series, not necessarily... I wanted this, but I needed this today. I wonder, would you join me and just lift your hand up? All of the room, all of our locations, online, you can participate in this. And then would you open your heart up to God with me? Let me pray it over us. Jesus, we love you and honor you today. You've been so good to us, and we, we lose sight of how good you've been. I do. It happens to all of us. We get focused on the treasures of this world or focused on our worries about this world, focused on comparing ourselves with somebody who has more and we, we forget how good you've been to us. But Jesus, today, for all of us who put our faith in you, we remember that you gave your body and your blood so that we could be saved. And if that was the only gift you had ever given, it would be enough. But then you have added to that blessing after blessing if we'll pay attention to it. You've been good to us. Today, help us as your people. Be generous with what you've given us. Jesus, help us be encouraged to know that you see every sacrifice. You are watching, and you'll reward everything that we do to honor your name. We believe you for it, and we pray it by faith in Jesus' name.
And if you're in the room today at one of our locations or watching online and you don't have a real relationship with God yet, here's what I want you to know. Listen very closely. You can be forgiven of everything that separated you from God. You can be made new and you can be saved through giving, but not your giving. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but would have real life. You don't have to give anything. You don't have to prove anything. You don't have to impress him. When you believe in Jesus and you make a decision by faith to follow him, you become a child of God and you, you experience what Jesus gave so that you could have new life. And if you want that today, I'd love to lead you in a very simple prayer to take that step. So I want everyone to join me again, open your heart up to God. And if that's you in the room or watching online, if you wanna begin following Jesus, whisper out a prayer face, something like this. Jesus, today, I'm surrendering my life to you. I hold nothing back and I believe in you today. I'm trusting you to save me believing in your death to forgive my sins, believing that you rose again to give me power. I'm yours from this day on. And if that's you, while everyone around you stays focused on God, if you would say, I wanna be included in that prayer today, I'm putting my faith in Jesus, would you lift your hand, just hold it up high and boldly. If you would say, I'm trusting Jesus with my life today, I'm putting my faith in him. At all of our locations, online, type the word faith in the comments. Let us know you're taking that step. And then Journey, would you help me? Come on, let's give Jesus all the praise together. Can we do that? And then stay right here in the room with me. We're gonna wrap up in just a couple of minutes, but I wanted to take this time uh, for all of our locations this weekend as we celebrate our Easter offering and uh, just give you an opportunity to participate. And if you're new here, we're not gonna pass anything around the room. But you'll see some ways, if you wanna be a part of this, uh, some ways you can give on the screens on either side of me. And this is an opportunity uh, for us to be generous for the people around us in our region who are in need. We're gonna give to build that specialized food uh, truck that's gonna be able to take fresh quality food to people in need all throughout our region. I'm very excited about that. Part of what we call Code Red and being the hands and feet of Jesus, getting compassion to the people who need it most. We're giving to invest in leaders and plant churches. We've actually identified hundreds of cities around America that need life-giving churches, and we have slowly but surely been funding the planting of churches in those cities. We're gonna keep doing that through your giving. We're gonna coach pastors, train pastors. We've been bringing pastors here uh, throughout the year to give them the training they need to make a difference in their city. All it's gonna happen through your giving, and then we're giving to expand our reach throughout Journey City to create more ways for people to experience God here. And I wanna invite you to be a part of that. I do wanna say that as part of that today, if you are here in the room and you are having trouble financially, especially in the area of food, it's very important to me that we're not just sending food out to people that we don't know, but if you're a part of this community of faith and you can't buy groceries this weekend, uh, we have an opportunity here for you to get some help. You can go to Journey Central in the cafe. We have grocery gift cards. Our prayer t team will be uh, at the front in just a moment. They'd love to pray with you and give you one of those cards. All you have to do is ask, no strings attached. We wanna make sure that you have what you need as well. Susie and I gave leading into this weekend. I know many of you already have given, but uh, for others of you, this is your opportunity. Whether you're a rich person putting in a large amount, or a poor widow putting in two small coins or anywhere in between. Jesus sees it, Jesus will honor it, and we're gonna change the world through it. Does that sound good to everybody? Yeah. So I'm gonna lead us in prayer and uh, we're gonna give together. Father, we love you, praise you. God, one more time, Jesus, I just wanna give you all the thanks as people give right now toward what matters to you. Take it and multiply it. God, we don't give for us, we're not building something for us. We wanna see the lost and the hurting and the hungry find hope through Jesus Christ. And God, it's our honor to take what we have and to lay it down at your feet to give, not to store up treasures in this world, but to store up treasures in heaven. And Jesus, what we give today, we know it will count more to you because it means more to us. 
multiply it, use it, we pray, and bless us as we give in Jesus' name. And one more time, will you help me? Come on, let's give Jesus all the praise together, Journey.